Okay, hopefully we're getting audio and video. Can I get confirmation? Sound good. Good to hear. Um, so, yesterday we were working on code for the Keep Talking and Nobody Explodes uh, module passwords. A lot of uh, basically algorithm stuff. Um, I did do some work after the stream and got it working. Uh, it took a little while. So I thought we might run through some of that and actually try to comment the code out. Because right now it is a nightmare. And uh, <laughs> if I ever have to revisit it, I would like to have comments. As would, I'm sure, anyone who has to come after me and do something with this project. Um, I was kind of hoping to actually be starting to build some of the parts on stream. But sadly, uh, while some of the components, like these little corner cubes for the extrusions, did come uh, yesterday, the majority of the metal necessary for the build uh, appears to be now arriving tomorrow instead of today, like I was hoping. Um, we may also mess around a bit in CAD, not necessarily to model the module, but just to try to figure out what approach we'll take. Given I have several different options for screens, so between older LCDs, uh, more modern L uh, OLED screens, which I have one on the board that's actually in use, or these like smaller OLED modules uh, per letter. We might mess around with seeing how each of those will be laid out. As I have a feeling the approach I'm using right now, which uses the uh, single module, which I'll bring a picture up of, um, is gonna be too small in, in the actual uh, model itself. In, kind of like how we had with the buttons, it just looked kind of silly, as tiny as it was. Um, I'm worried the same will be true. So, uh, this is the module as it is now. I quite like the appearance of it, but it is tiny. Um, only taking up about a third of the space in the middle of this module, which uh, I think is maybe too small, so I might looking look into other options for that. Um, since we're already diverging from the appearance of the original, um, as the original Keep Talking Nobody Explodes Passwords module has this much larger green uh, colored screen, which as far this is definitely supposed to look like an LCD. Uh, but I have yet to ever find or, uh, like, I've been, able, I've been unable to locate an LCD screen, a graphical LCD, uh, of this rough dimension or size. In theory, there are ways to do this where you kind of split up the characters of a typical character LCD, like this one. Um, which has that, which actually has the same appearance of that. Um, these look almost identical. Uh but would have seams running through the letters. So I'm not sure if that's what, how we'll try to do it. But that aside, the new code is here and it is quite an impressive amount of, uh, so what we, what we got through together is we created reset everything. Uh, this little bit of code here uh, is where it possible. We refined from our previous version. This is a much better piece of code now um, and we created a, a lot of removed letters. Um, but we didn't quite finish it. We just got to the point where it was doing, I believe we got through a good part of this. Um, I've removed, I've added a few new things. So I added in uh, the everything is flames, all is lost check. Um, if this comes back true, everything is flames and all is lost. So hopefully that will never be true. Um, it's not been recently. <laughs> um, and then I added in some code for uh, printing out the results and then generating the final list uh, of options we'll use in the actual game. All this basically does is pick five letters uh, at each position and then shuffle them up. So this little bit shuffles them at the end. And then this is just fancy code for printing it out all nice looking. And so when we run this code, we get a really nice readout. So we get all of this, which is 
very fancy looking, but tells us everything about what happened uh, as it's generated the code. And so in, in this example, we can see it chose the word thing. And so then it started going through all of the words in, the, in a random order. So it went through again. It said, okay, I'm gonna pick position three. So the A, um, or sorry, position three, which would be the uh, fourth position because zero through four, not one through five. Um, so it said, okay, N versus I, these are different. So I'm removing I from the list. So I in the third position is now removed. So it went, okay, zeroth position, the W here, removing W does not match T, it's being removed. Uh, this one, it removed the O from sound. And now this one, right, uh, when it looked at right, it said, okay, uh, well, the I in the, or wait, let's see which one it actually removed here, which one caused it. Uh, removed a W, yeah. So it removed, we had already removed a W from the first position. And so when it got to which, it just saw, oh, which is already impossible. And so it didn't remove anything, which is why there's just nothing after it. And so it went down the line, it removed one for, so which and right were both removed because of that W place. It removed the A from the third position. And then all of these, it didn't remove anything because they're already impossible. And so you can see there's, there's a little bit of a weirdness here. This one is longer than all the others. What happened here is it went, okay, I'm going to remove an H from the first position, so this H. But then if it had done that, thing would also be impossible. And so it realized, oh, these are the same letter. I can't remove that. I'm going to pick a different one. And it picked four, G and E. Uh, so in this case, it would be this E versus this G. They're different, so it removed the E. Um, with the everything is flames, all is lost check. If this line ever gets all the way through the letters, so if it attempts all five letters and finds all of them have to be the way they are, then obviously it would mean that this word would have to remain possible. So as an example, uh, I, can, I could actually cause this. Actually, why not? We'll cause it. So one of the ways this could happen is if this word appears twice. And so if I go in here and make, um, let's, let's use one that we can remember. So uh, I'm going to change the, I'll change the first word about, uh, I'm gonna make sure I remember that, but I'm gonna change this to after. So we have two afters, which would be very bad. Um, but if I upload this piece of code now, there is now a chance, even with our with our new code, that in theory should always fix things. There's a chance that if so, if af, if after is ever chosen as the word, it would try to remove make the word after impossible, without making the word after impossible, which is impossible. And so everything will be flame. Um, and so if we bring up the serial monitor here and I hit the button, we'll see if, so water, not the word, found, not the word. We do have to have it actually land on after. Um, ah, here we go. So it chose the word after. And so you can see when it got to the word after, it tried to remove the E, that failed. It tried to remove the A, that failed. It tried to remove the T, that failed. It tried to remove the R, that failed. It tried to remove the F, failed. And because all five letters failed, it then failed the check and everything was flame. You'll notice it actually still tried to generate a sequence. And what's interesting about this sequence is that I believe this would actually still be valid. Because if you think about if after is how you win, this has after as an option, and all the other words here are still impossible. Um, and so in a, in a, in a kind of nice way, this is robust enough to, in theory, make it so that uh, even that didn't really cause a, a catastrophic failure, this would still work. But if this happens, or 
in the event that it somehow removes so many characters, it can't have six here. So let's say you had a list of hundreds upon hundreds of words. Every single letter was contained in them, and it ended up removing every single letter except the correct one. Then it would have nothing to put in these spots, and that would also be a failure. And so failure will only happen if it runs out of letters. So in this case, I have that set to six. It needs six letters per position to be left. Uh, or if this happens, then it will fail. Um, everything else should be correct. And I'm going to bring back about <laughs> uh, and re-upload that. So that's what the catastrophic failure function looks for. And you can see those checks in here if I move to here. Um, we have our everything is flames all is lost variable. And what I'm doing is every single time it goes through this loop, it's going to be counting up. Um, if it succeeds, it sets the loop to 9, which then gets turned to 10. So this will be 10 when it exits the loop, if it was successful. If it was unsuccessful, it will, n it will not execute this piece of code, and it'll come out as 4, get added 1, 5, this will be true, loop num equals equals five. And so this will be run true and everything is lost, which would be false or equals, um, which is a logical operator that says, uh, I take this or this and I set this to be equal to that. Um, and for anyone who might be unfamiliar with logical or, the logical or operator is a check that basically says, uh, so if either of the inputs are true, or is true. So true or false is true, false or true is true, true or true is true, false or false is false. Um, and so in this case, provided this always ends up false, this will never become true. And so flames will not be lost, or, or everything is flames will not be true. Um, the only other event that can cause that is in, oh goodness, this code is, is a bit of a mess. Um, doo -doo -doo -doo. Um, right, the check right, I'm trying to find the number I put um, right here. It will also fail if um, the number of letters left in the position becomes less than or equal to the number of options that we're requiring. So num options in our case is six. We have to have six things in order to fill in the wheel. And so it will fail if that's not true. Um, let's see, other things that were important about this code that changed. Um, see oh oh the, yeah so this is this is one of the cases where you can see that that actually being useful so it shows the word point and one of the other words is plant and so that is p uh in t are all the same between them and so it tried t tried that one it failed it tried this one it failed it tried this one it failed and then finally tried uh, the L and succeeded. Um, the reason that all of these are different, so you'll see this is like four, one, one, four, one, zero, four. They're kind of all over the place. There is one three in there. Um, is that this is once again random. This is a shuffled list. Uh, and in general, I think I've actually implemented almost everything in this as a form of shuffled list because they happen to be very easy and very fair. Uh, ways to do things, shuffling a list. Um, and you can always see the little visualizer of what the options are. And then this final bit is basically that turned on its side and picked out. So it picked the letter P, it picked the letter H, picked the letter D, J, you get the idea. Um, and if any of these ever is six or lower, then it causes problems. So we have a thing for that. Um, but in this case, that looks pretty good. And you can see that these little dots actually are the correct word. So P-O-I-N-T point. 
uh, and those are in random positions every time, but they're still marked as correct. And so you can think of this as being the starting position for like a combination lock, like each of these are the loops of a combination lock. And so in it, we'd have to move this up to move this down or uh, move this up three, move this down two, move this up one, that kind of thing, so that we get them all in a line uh, in our screen. And so in effect, this is complete code. Um, I've run this quite a few times and have yet to ever have this fail. I don't think it is theoretically possible for it to fail. Um, at least with these words. If we were to add more words, I think there may be a possibility of it failing. But I've never seen this go below like 18. <laughs> and the reason I think it is theoretically impossible for this to fail is because I believe there are always at least six letters that are not occurring in any given position. So if we had the int if we basically took uh, a five letter word from every letter of the alphabet or close to it and put them in this list, then it could fail because it could in theory choose this every single time and remove every well even then I, it may be still impossible because it would also have to be that all of these other positions would have to be impossible um so i don't think it would ever happen oh this is a fun one so could versus should uh sound again is had to remove a lot of options from multiple of these to get uh to the point where it could um we were having a discussion among some uh some friends of mine about whether or not this is random enough whether or not this will fool someone so if you think about B, A, J, I, C, M in the first position, um, whether or not there would be enough things that seem right for it to waste time. Like, because we don't, we don't want it to be obvious what the correct word is. There's only one that's possible, but we'd prefer it to be uh, fairly difficult to figure out which one it is. Uh, but at the same time, uh, I talked to some of the modding community for Keep Talking Nobody Explodes, and from everything everyone knows about the game code, uh, this is what it does. It just randomly picks six. Or more accurately, while we pick six, it actually takes this list and starts removing things at random from it. Um, that's just the difference between we're using C++, which is a language that is designed for uh, fixed memory state so we can't just go arbitrarily changing the size of things easily um, we kind of have to keep things in these nice orderly arrays of fixed length whereas the game is written in C sharp which will happily change the size of an array just like Python or uh, some other languages like that um, and so we just have to be a little more careful we have to do things often by selection or by shuffling rather than doing it via um, removal or addition uh, as the way C Sharp does it. It's super hard to program in a way to make a computer think about how easily a human could perceive the actual world. Yeah, so that that's a thing that we, we've talked about a bit and this game is an excellent example of is uh, the logic for a computer versus the logic, of, the way our, a human thinks is weird. And I actually have to be careful about that as I'm making these. So, like, when I'm looking at this and, like, okay, is it random? Ooh, there are three 22s. Or, oh, all, like, three of them ended up down here. Or, uh, it seems like there's a lot of threes there. Things like that. Like, even just looking at this, you're going to start seeing what you think are patterns. Like, look at, look at these big blocks of ones. Or... These are all in the first two rows. That must mean something, right? Like, human brains want patterns. <laughs> um, our brains are designed to look for patterns. And when we think of randomness, we, aren't, we don't think of real randomness. Humans are terrible at real randomness. What we see when we see real randomness is we try to, we see patterns. And so in order to make something random... What we want, what our brain thinks is random, is actually way less random. Um, 
one of the best examples of that is there's a pretty classic uh, experiment when you're when you're uh, teaching, especially children, um, about like how randomness is different from what they think it is. Uh, in something like a statistics class, I've had a teacher do this. Um, you tell one one you split split the students up into groups, and you give one student one group of students an actual penny. And you have them flip it a hundred times, record what the results are. So that's a truly random head tail, head tail kind of sequence, right? You might write them down as ones and zeros, or you might write them down as dots and, and ovals, whatever, whatever is clearest. And then you have other groups try to, in their head, come up with a random sequence and write it down. And so you would think that students might be okay at creating a random sequence, like that we could write down something that is random. The problem is, uh, over the course of an, of an 100 coin flip set, according to real probability, it's fairly likely you will have a long sequence of the same thing. You'll have, I don't know, 12 heads in a row. Or you'll have, um, what, what's another good, or, or you'll have like head tail, head tail, head tail for like, 10, 10 straight, something like that. Things that don't seem random because randomness doesn't care. They're all independent events. It's unlikely, but when you assume that, when you look at it as a perspective of from any of these given positions I start at, there's the same likelihood it'll happen. It probably will happen. Um, and, and But our brain doesn't like that. Our brain wants things to be, our randomness is like, like has an extent of like five. So if we see any more than five of the same thing in a row, it stops seeming random to us. To us, random means different every time. Uh, and so if a teacher knows that, they can often come back into the room after all those have been flipped, look at these students' examples, and immediately pick out who was re who has had real coins and who had who was just making up the sequence. And it's just because of we as humans just are really, really bad at understanding chance, which was a big issue when I was debugging this code last night, is I would look at this and go, that doesn't look random. Like, I'd be printing off these and I'd be seeing this and like, like all of them are here. They're still all in the middle. And, and, and then I'd get to one like this and I'm like, well, that could have just been random. Now most of them are in the middle again. Things like, like you, your brain comes up with an answer to what's going on. Like, oh, I almost never see them in the bottom. There's still only one in the bottom. There's none in the bottom. Like, like, and as I go through this, because I've made a note and I'm, I'm, I'm seeking confirmation of what I think, I'm going to keep finding evidence of it and I'm going to start ignoring other evidence of it. <laughs> um... Now, what was interesting is it turns out my original attempt was actually bias. I messed up in my code. Um, specifically, and I can bring up the spots where this happened. So I had copied a chunk of code to down here. And the issue was where I had put this, this J here and this J here in the original piece of code I copied from were I. But in this case, I'm iterating across J. And so it was wrong. It was very wrong. It was shuffling far too many times than it should have. And weirdly enough, if you over shuffle something uh, due to the way we're handling the data, it actually can kind of undo some of this randomness. And so due to that, it was actually extremely unlikely to ever have a correct solution be at the bottom of the list just the way it worked out um but it took a long time for me to actually confirm that it was not just my internal bias that i was looking at uh and that it was actually bias in the code when i found out that these yeah those were wrong um and goodness i need to work like this all this code is kind of rough looking but um and the way to solve that would have been to actually have this randomness function or this shuffle function be its own function, um, I, which I would have done, except the Arduino reference thing seems to still be uh, down. 
sadly. Um, I have no idea what's going on over on Arduino. I haven't been able to find any information. But for some reason, Arduino's reference site is down for uh, where I am. So until that's back, I don't know how to use, uh, how to create a function that is able to accept multiple data types and still modify things correctly. Um, I do not know if there is a way to do that. I think there is, but it's probably something more advanced than what we're doing. So for now, I've just copied the code. Um, and there was one other thing that I messed up somewhere. I'm trying to remember what it was. Um, Hmm. There was some piece of code somewhere around here also that had a mistake in it. Um, I think I had like flipped a J. An, either it was either an I or a J or flipped or. Uh, oh no, sorry. Yeah, it was up here. I believe I had all words and all options. I had switched the names, and so it was doing something entirely wrong. Um, which may be more evidence that I should be using uh, clearer names here. I mean, I only have like five variables, but they are kind of similar. I mean, we have all options and all words, and that's not the clearest thing. <laughs> um, maybe I should be calling this something like, I don't know, uh, possible words, and then this is uh, all options and then I called this final options, which is the ones it actually selects at the end. Um, who knows? Um, it's definitely not the clearest thing, but I think that's why we should go through and do a little bit of a, uh, we'll call it a commenting spree. Um, and basically just start adding comments along the side here uh, to explain what in the world is going on in the majority of this code. Um, I personally like to put all my comments in a row when I'm doing official code. So what I'm doing here is I'm, I'm literally just scrolling, but I'm gonna pick a spot somewhere around here that I like the distance of. So basically I want something where the majority of the code does not extend past it. Obviously there's this, these like few nightmare lines um, right here, and they're gonna stick past anything I put. Um, but I would like everything else to be within this boundary. So right here, this bit of code here is beyond it. So I'm gonna maybe go there, gonna scroll. So it looks like everything is within this boundary right here. So somewhere around here, and we can do this by local area. And I probably will do that in this case. Um, so like have, like, so this bubble here, all the comments could fit like right here. Um, so we're going to start off with, we don't need this. These are all the includes for the screen. Uh, we're going to add in a little header. So uh, we'll call this area variables. And I like to do this little like slash slash on either side of when I do something like this. Um, completely not important though <laughs> and we'll do a we'll put a little return after that maybe we'll add some stuff here to make it easier to spot do something like that so we have a nice something that is separating our code here more visibly Add random comments like that. <laughs> uh, there are definitely people who do that. Uh, and it really depends on what you're doing. When you're writing code this short, like admittedly this looks long, but this is only, this is less than 200 lines of code. Um, and frankly, a lot of this is just code to print off fancy stuff. So like to make these little fancy visuals when I do this, uh, when I'm debugging, all of this fancy stuff here is completely unnecessary. Like. The stuff will happen whether or not I print it out. <laughs> um, which we may actually decide to make. Uh, <laughs> oh no, bad pun. Oh. <laughs> uh, 
Uh, you, you say that um, I actually very much enjoy occasionally uh, looking through the so that there is a, a network of passwords um, from the majority of major password hacks that have occurred known as the uh, pond table PWNED um, or maybe it's PWND but you can actually look up a password and know how many times it has been found uh, in basically big tables of passwords that people have released from hacks. Um, or just guessing, could be guessing as well. But it is surprising how often what you would think, like basically any short password you can think of that you're like, oh, no one could possibly have come up with this. Nope, it's in there. Uh, <laughs> and, and, but what's amusing is adding a space or a capital immediately lowers the number and anything longer than, uh, I don't know, maybe, I don't know, 15, 20 characters, extremely unlikely. There are a few exceptions to that. One of the notable ones being correct horse battery staple, um, which, uh, um, amusingly enough, is a password given as an example uh, in the comic XKCD as a good password. Uh, despite, obviously, the comic also saying you should never use the password correct horse battery staple, um, as once you tell someone your password, it's no longer a secure password, <laughs> and if it's, you post it on the internet, it definitely is not. Um, but it is surprising how common a... Yes, so Have I Been Pwned is one of the ones... Uh, what is actually an interesting thing about that system is that you can actually download the code that it, uh, it runs and run it locally, which means that you don't actually have to trust the website uh, that like, because up putting your password on a password checking site is a really good way to give your password to someone who's looking for passwords. Um, since I, like I, I, you may trust the site and it, they may be trustworthy, um, but unless you can guarantee the site you're sending your password to is trustworthy, it may be a poor idea to send your actual, an actual password of yours to a site. And I believe that site, the Have I Been Pwned, even says, do not actually type your password in on it. Um, and so the, the safe way, quote unquote, to do it is, and I think I have it here somewhere, uh, let me find it, is there's actually a Python script you can load that will bring up that same terminal. Um, <laughs> and that allows you to check using something called k-anonymity, which uh, I can explain really quick. It's actually a really cool idea. So uh, there are functions, um, and I'm going to basically just use a little spot here to explain this. Uh, there are functions that are ba uh, called hashes, that basically you can take in a piece of text, um, like if I did test, it might return something like that, right? Um, obviously much longer. Most of them return 256 characters or more. Um, but what's interesting is this piece of text, there's no way to figure out that this came from this, except to try this and get the same result. So every time I put in test, I'll get this result out, but it's almost impossible because there is no mathematical reverse of this operation. Um, a good example of this would be the multiplication of two prime numbers. So if I say, um, and I can kind of give an example of this. So if I, if I take the, like a calculator and I bring up, I multiply two prime numbers together. So if I take the number 13, which is a prime number, and multiply it by 7, which is a prime number, I get 91. Now, it's asking what two prime numbers are, uh, are multiplied to become 91 is a much harder problem to go back from because there is no way to just automatically do that except to check every number and see if it evenly divides into something. Um, and so, if you have two prime numbers that are each... I don't know, 20 digits long, and you multiply those two together, you can imagine how much processing power it'll take to undo that operation. And so that's the essence of, uh, and the, they're not normally prime numbers these days. There are 
much more efficient ways to create that. Um, but basically you end up with a thing that, that you know, if the user types this in again, you'll always get this, but you can't undo it to this. And so even if I take the beginning bit of this, just the first four letters of it, um, like there's essentially infinite completely unpredictable or not infinite but there might be millions of things that contain these have this beginning but it's not going to be test it's not like i'm saying uh like if i do test and text when i hash these two the letter combinations that come out will have absolutely no relationship to each other so i can't tell that they have the same beginning and so the way that the pond database does it is they do this to every password. So if they have the word test, they would hash it and store this. And then when you type in your password, your computer says, okay, I'm gonna, just going to send them the beginning bit of this. I'm going to send that and I'm going to ask them to send me back everything they have that has this beginning. And I'm going to look through the endings. And so they send you, when you, when they send you back, they might know that uh, the thing you asked for might be in the list, but they can't confirm it. Only your computer actually knows if your password was in the list, and that's what they call K anonymity. It's basically anonymity through a massive number of options that are entirely unpredictable. Um, but that, that's how it works. It's a really cool uh, project. I completely recommend messing around, typing in some passwords you might use, see if they're on there. If they are, please change them. Um, <laughs> if your passwords are in the... So that's the other thing. If you are... Uh, if you do send your password to a pond database and see it, obviously change it. If you don't see your password and use the website, probably change it anyway because now it's out there in the, real, in the internet. But if you do it on this, and you see that your password is not on the list, it at least means it's probably decent. It means no one, no one they have ever hacked has had your password, <laughs> uh, at least to the to your knowledge. Obviously, not every hack is going to be in this list. Um, but that's yeah. Oh, sorry, long tangent there. About almost twenty minutes. Goodness. Um, but I absolutely would recommend messing around with when it comes to passwords. Um, and would they even make sense uh, or make fun of this a little bit um, in the game itself because this does not um, let me see if I can actually find the text I believe I have a manual here somewhere uh, yes here we go so if I the official manual page for this password module um, actually mentions how bad an idea this is and specifically calls it out as fortunately this password doesn't seem to meet standard government security requirements of 22 characters mixed case numbers in ra uh, in random order without any palindromes above the length of three which is an actual really good password requirement if you want a good password requirement try to meet that at least 22 characters mixed case meaning you have at least some capitals in there Numbers in random order, so no one, two, threes, no five, six, sevens. Trust me, they try that. Um, and no palindromes above the length of three, so no one, two, three, three, two, ones. <laughs> um, which, yeah, I, I absolutely love they point this out because, yes, a five letter word is a terrible password. Um, mind you, lots of schools do that, which is a bad idea anyway, but. If you can look up your password in a dictionary, um, no, actually the, the, the word password is one of the most commonly used passwords and has thousands upon thousands of uh, checks on, oh, let me actually bring it up because it, I think it is fun just to mess with this. I mean, we're just having fun here. So let's see. I know I have, um, I got that thumb drive, there it is. I can uh, actually launch this. Programs, pond, 
So I'm just going to put this here. So this is the Python script. I believe there is some newer versions of it, but we'll use this one. Um, <laughs> so you can see it is literally just a Python script with some extra tools in it. Uh, I believe there might be a GUI now, um, but this one does not have it. So I'm just going to load up a console. Um, there we go. And I need to move to uh, the drive, which I believe is, uh, I'm going to check, I think my desktop is on drive B. Um, yes, it is. Okay. So on, I'm using a Ubuntu console uh, within Windows, which you can do if you have Pro. Um, I'm trying to remember how to get around this. So CD, D, CD, desktop, CD, PWN, pond, uh, and then I'm going to do a clear, and then run pond.py. So uh, but that's Python three pwn dot pi. There we go. Okay, so we have this is the pond actual console. Uh, I'm going to make it bigger, and we can try some stuff out because this is fun, and I mean that's what we're here for. So what if we made a password one two three? So you can see password itself comes up. A lot of times um, over 3 million individual hacks have had the word pa the password password in them uh, if we do password one two three I'm sad to say it still occurs a uh, hundred over a hundred thousand times <laughs> um, some Adding things like capitals will reduce it again. Again, you can see it's about 100,000 times. Um, <laughs> well, optimally, you wouldn't have this ever occur. Um, amusingly enough, you, there are some fairly long passwords that occur. As an example, you can have a lot of digits of pi and still have it occur quite frequently. <laughs> um, annoyingly, uh, correct horse battery staple which is a very nice long password um, of course occurs 123 times because someone said it on the internet um, <laughs> uh, you got any other ideas I'm, I'm willing to type whatever into this um, and yes whatever is a password uh, amusingly enough there are also so as an example things like user Obviously, password, admin, they all occur. Um, <laughs> I do not have the script of the B-movie with me, um, but I would not be surprised if the beginning of it is in there. Let me look up what the beginning of it is. Because that's exactly the kind of thing someone would try. Now, mind you, just because it doesn't show up on this list does not mean that it... it uh, it is not a valid password. This is only designed to find passwords that are known. If something has never been hacked before, it doesn't mean someone doesn't have it as a password. It just means that it hasn't ended up in one of these hacks. Um, oh, right, I can't actually um, paste into this the typical way. So, let's see. I believe it is what, according to, something like that. Okay, so one thing I've found is that people don't like putting spaces in their uh, passwords for some reason. That might actually be long enough where it won't matter. So that's the other thing is long passwords are very unlikely to show up in this list only because they have to have been hacked before 
And if they aren't hacked, uh, in general, people try to hack short passwords first. Um, <laughs> so that's the thing. When you say that, you, you joke about that, but it is legitimately a good way to find passwords. If you have a specific passage from a book you really like, that is at least not so common that lots and lots of other people are going to be using it. As an example, I'd probably recommend against, say, common Bible verses, because they are well-known phrases on the internet. Um, same with something like, I probably wouldn't use the password so long and thanks for all the fish on an account I've cared about, because that is a well-known phrase, even if it's a bit niche in Doug as being uh, from Douglas Adams' books. Um, but they're still good passwords. Like, really long passwords will save you from a lot of hacks only because they won't even try passwords that long. Unless it's an extremely well-known password. As an example, correct horse battery staple is a long password that occurs often enough that they'd probably try it. Because it is now on this whole thing would be referred to as a type of rainbow table. A table of known passwords. Um... NTSU makes me change my password with every six months. Ah, so interestingly, I believe they only require you to do that often if you aren't using two-factor. And two-factor is a better approach anyway. Um, I think it's only once a year you have to change it if you're on two-factor. Um, two-factor, uh, for anyone not familiar, just requires you to use something like a phone, uh, some additional, the, it's called two-factor because you have to have an additional physical factor in order to log in, uh, two-factor basically solves the issue of having a bad password. Because if you had a bad password, they try it. They still can't log in because you they don't have your access to your phone or to your cryptographic key. Um, you can get cryptographic keys as well. So that's something you have to plug in physically that contains a massively long password or that requires an exchange with the system. Um, Interestingly enough, it's also the case you don't have to have a physical device in the sense of something web-connected for two-factor. You can also have a rolling password, something like, uh, I mean, a classical example of this in theory is the nuclear football, which is a device that constantly has randomly generating passwords in sync with another device. And so you can't log in unless you know the password at that moment. Uh, if you use Steam Guard, uh, that is one of the platforms I know, uh, Steam, the online gaming platform, actually makes use of that rolling password system. So your phone doesn't actually have to be connected to the internet for you to use it to unlock your devices, uh, which is very convenient. Um, I believe that uh, the Google, um, or what's it called, uh, Duo or whatever the new one is from Google also may have an option for that, uh, but I do not know for sure. Um, but rotating key passwords are another really good way around this. So, yeah, this is Pond. I'm going to keep it up in the background in case we have any more ideas. But, <laughs> um, yeah, in general, you want to be a bit careful with your passwords and not do that. Don't do this, goodness. Um, <laughs> but uh, that's kind of just how security works. I mean, uh Passwords are literally a form of security through obscurity, which a lot of people will tell you is not a good form of security. Um, I tend to agree. Um, so you want to make your password extraordinarily obscure if you want it to have a chance. <laughs> um, and that means make it longer than, like, if, if something says you have to have eight characters, ignore that. Make it like 20 or longer. Um, humans can type sentences really fast on a keyboard. And so, like, a password like, um, so long, like, uh, the example I made before, so long and thanks for all the fish, is a very long sentence. 40-some characters, at least, I believe. Uh, great way to add it. If you want to add more security, tack on some numbers or something along those lines. Um, uh, a, a, a not... Now, obviously, I'm saying this, and I'm saying don't do exactly this because I'm coming up with something. Again, you should always come up with your own thing, uh, so preferably something that's not the first thing that comes into your head because probably someone's done that already. Um, but you might do add a pound symbol at the beginning. 
You might add a period at the end. You might have the, sp have the spaces in the middle of the sentence. That helps. Um, tack on some numbers at the end. Anything you do to make your... If you take a sentence that's long, you've immediately prevented standard guessing attacks because no one's going to guess something 40-some characters long. It'll take... There's too many options. If you can then add in something else, which would, might be referred to as a salt in your password... Um, it's not technically a salt. Salt is different, but it's similar. Um, you can make your password extraordinarily difficult to guess, even if someone knows the sentence, because no one's going to try a random 40 character long password and then start trying to add stuff on top of it. Um, unless they already know there's a good chance it's correct, like a correct horse battery staple, uh, it, it makes no sense for a hacker to spend time trying that kind of password. Uh, because every password they want to try, they want to have the highest chance of being a correct password. Um, if you are harder than 99% of other people to hack, you probably won't get hacked because they'll just hack the other people. <laughs> um, it, it's legitimately the way the internet kind of works. Uh, the worse your passwords are, or the more obvious they are, or another big thing, if your password is the same on different sites, um, that is how you get multiple hacks. And uh, there is a recommendation. I don't know if I can necessarily say this is a perfect method, but if you can take a good password, I mean, legitimately, please just use a password manager. It's the correct thing to do at this point. Um, but if you do want to not use password managers, get a really good password, a long one. Um, yeah, I think they've recently changed the policy with the passwords. Yeah. Um, so get a nice long password, 40 some characters. Then every time you have a new site, take, I don't know, could be like, you might take like the, the third, the seventh and the 10th letters of the URL of the site you're logging into and you tack those at the end of your password or you use them to do something to your password. Which means that even if the password for that site is found, it'll at least take a human looking at your password to understand why you made the change to your password and to then go try other accounts. That's another thing I think a lot of people don't necessarily realize. You as an individual are not worth much to a hacker. Um, it's the easy people who are worth a lot to the hacker. And so if you can make it so that your password is different on every account you use, even if there is a pattern, as long as it's a long password, and as long as that pattern is not insanely obvious that they might have some algorithm that can handle it, again, probably you're safe. Like, <laughs> um, And I do say all of this with the caveat of if you just use a password manager uh, and two-factor, or just two-factor, or just a password manager. They're both excellent systems. Your password really doesn't matter now. Um, <laughs> like, your password is a key. Um, if you use a password manager, you want to have an extraordinarily strong password for your manager, but then all of your other passwords kind of stop mattering because it will fill them in with extraordinarily long passwords. Um, if you use two-factor, have a good password Make it difficult for the first, for someone to hack your account. But you should still have peace of mind knowing that as long as you aren't there or they don't have access to your phone, um, which is serving as that second link, they will fail to actually hack the account. They will fail to get in via that first link as long as everything is set up correctly. Um, okay, I think we've spent like half an hour on this rant about passwords. Uh, hopefully that wasn't too boring for anyone. Um <laughs> Uh, we'll get back to coding for a little bit, I think, or at least a little, commenting a little bit. Um, try to make this somewhat understandable. Goodness, this is a nightmare of code, though. So, <laughs> yeah, hopefully some people find that helpful. Um, I'm definitely no security expert, but I do like to be aware of what's going on. Um, I think anyone who uses the internet a lot probably should try to uh, keep on top of things. So things like um, I don't know, knowing, like knowing, being, just paying attention and being aware of what security, uh, like what the security around you is doing 
can save you from a lot of just kind of the negligence issues that comes with it. Um, some of those can be a bit serious, uh, and some of them probably don't matter. Uh, one of the ones I'll mention, and I'm going to cover up the bits of the card that actually have identifying information, um, but as an example, our student ID cards, like this one, uh, happen to use HID iClass uh, technology, which isn't secure. I don't know if, uh, I, I'm sure they know that. I'm sure NC State is aware, but that's the thing. Uh, which maybe most people are not aware of, is that these cards we have are not secure. Um, they're just there. <laughs> um, now, mind you, they don't actually mean anything in the real world. They don't hold money, uh, or at least I hope they don't. I guess they technically have some control over money, but they really shouldn't. Um, yeah, not, not a great security option. They just open doors for the most part. I think it's okay. Uh, but it's a good thing to know that, so you wouldn't try to assign something powerful to this card. Um, like knowing what technologies are fragile. <laughs> um, like a, another good example, your credit card, it's a number. It's literally just a sort number. A lot of that number is predetermined. Uh, it has a checksum in it, sure. Um, but there are only so many attempts it'll take someone to figure out a card. Um... And because of that, that's why they have the number on the back that helps. The chip is much better. It's not perfect, but it's better. Um, but realistically, uh, COVID, if there's anything that's positive that's come out of it, most stores now accept contactless payment. If they have contactless payment, you can use your phone. Uh, and if you have your phone, your phone doesn't do the same thing as a card. It doesn't just pass along your information out and clear uh, your phone actually gives a unique identifier for the transaction with the correct amount um, and that information realistically cannot be used for um... <laughs> yeah I'm, I'm not so the problem with that uh, you've mentioned there is it still means I shouldn't give it out like I'm still relying on security through obscurity even if I don't like it <laughs> I can't change it. Just like your social security number. Social security number. Horrible way to identify someone. It literally used to say on the social security card not to be used for identification. They took it off because everyone was using it for identification. Um, <laughs> uh, and that said, that is one of the most dangerous numbers for Americans. Um, our credit card numbers can be replaced. Our social security numbers really can't. Um, or at least not easily. So keep that safe. Um, <laughs> um, that said, there are always sneaky ways to store your stuff. Um, if you are like me and have a really hard time remembering, uh, what your, what things like social security numbers are, I'll just give this helpful bit of thing. Uh, your phone has a contact area and things like zip codes, social security numbers, all of that are shorter than the standard phone number. Meaning, all of them can be encoded via a method of your own choosing. Please do not just write your social security number in your phone in a phone field. But you can make a contact number to store things in and modify them using some cryptographic method you have. That might be counting, that might be offsetting, whatever you want to do. Um, again, security through obscurity is a bad idea. But in small amounts and when it's not on the internet, it's not a, the worst way to store it. It's much better than having a text file on your computer that has all of your passwords. Please never do that. <laughs> um, security through obscurity is a legitimate practice when you are the only one who is likely to encounter it. And when people who are otherwise would encounter it will have no way of knowing that it is a password. Um, I'm not going to recommend that. It's best to just memorize things. But I have a terrible memory, and so I do sneakily hide pieces of information around places I know. Um, I don't actually hide my social security number in my phone. Uh, that is an example. <laughs> I used to do it, admittedly, but I don't do it anymore. I actually remember that now. Uh, but it's a good example of if you need to hide numbers, there are good ways to do it by just changing it into other data. Um, and that's a basic example. You could also do something like... Uh, 
turn all of those into letters of the alphabet. Uh, that's why our phones have, to some degree, have those letters on them, is you can actually turn a word into a number that way. Or more accurately, you can actually take a number, turn it into a word. Um, that could be a useful way to do it. Um, where were we? Oh, yeah, we were coding. <laughs> So I'm just going to start talking. So uh, all options is an array that keeps track of what letters are possible in each position. This letters left is array to track number of Possible letters in each uh, we'll actually say track number of true uh, values in all options. Put a, that so basically uh, and this is a fairly common practice uh, in Arduino is even though this is a fixed size if I just get the size of something in Arduino it doesn't necessarily give me useful data given a boolean is an eighth the size of int things like that happen and so we often just make a second variable to keep track of something like how big this is because as long as we change this variable, every time we change this variable, it doesn't matter. It's just easier. <laughs> um, this one's pretty obvious. This is the array of all words, well, all being considered contingent or made possible. Go down here. I think this is at the same, yeah. Uh, word count. Number, whoops. Items within the all words array. Options, number of letters that will be made, options, final array, we'll call it final output. A to track. Final output. Okay. Let's see. I do wonder if it would be worth rearranging this to make this all one nice brick. Hmm. Probably not. So, man, I really would like to make this external code because we use this shuffling algorithm multiple times uh, throughout the code. Hmm. The question is, is, so right here we're defining a string temp. In this, in another spot where we're running the same code, we're creating an int temp. And in another spot, we are creating a car temp. So we would need a way to uh, 
know what we need to define as the variable. Um, and while technically you can pass any variable into, into a large enough piece of data in Arduino, so as an example, a character can fit into an integer, an integer can fit into a character that's the same size roughly. Um, they won't always be interpreted correctly that way. So, <laughs> I guess we'll do default soil. First thing, add a new header. Okay. Actually, I'll just start copying this to make sure I have the same number. Functions. And those go all the way through to here, which is the setup. Which will probably change. Our four user defined functions, which I may split into a separate. Uh, uh, so we could actually put these in a separate file to make this all cleaner, which I might do. Um, that may look a lot better if we do that. Hmm. The other thing is, right now we have all these, con like, we don't have a lot of print lines like this one, but they are there. Um, and anytime you're going to print things, that can be, so, uh, I believe the code will run whether or not we actually have a serial line open, but it's not good practice to have that be the case. And so if we ever wanted to not have the serial line running, uh, which is a legitimate thing we might want, not want to have running, um, we'd want to turn all of that off. And preferably not just turn it off, but actually remove it from our code. And so that's where this stuff comes in. You can see these little if def things. Um, these allow you to control whether or not code is included uh, within your actual output. And so we might want to actually make use of that. Um, by defining, moving all this into an external area and then defining that. Um, so, let's see. But we, we shouldn't do that at the moment because we are defining these variables here and we would want those variables to be uh, external if we ever move them into another file, just for good practice. So, um, and so in this one, we have these in these comments that are inline. Personally, I find these difficult to read um, because they kind of merge in with the code. And so I'm actually going to move all of this out. Uh, and I am going to look at, so looks like about here, all of the code will fit. Just going to put it way out here. Resets. Um, we are resetting all options. And letters left. And then shuffles all words. Maybe that's too long. We'll accept. We're, it, we already know it's going to do that, so we'll just say um, pairs new uh, master generation. There we go. actually just going to comment this line here where it actually does something 
I'm going to say sets all letters in all positions as possible options. And, and this bit of code is the actual fancy bit that might need commenting. Um, and then we'll leave this block. Here we'll make a comment. Shuffles all words in all words array. And now we will actually comment what this does, how this does it. Using, so we're actually using the Durstenfeld. I'm gonna make sure to look up what, how to spell this guy's name. Cause it's actually, it's kind of nice sometimes to include how we're shuffling. Let's see. How often do you rely on comments to understand code that others write? Like, do you rely more on the comments just looking at code? I, comments are actually quite useful in that. Uh, so as an example, um, and I actually can bring up an actual example from Arduino here. So if I go into examples and go to a library for something I use. So as an example, I might want to know how to um, make use of the, the Nixie displays I have. So Xie, and we'll go, um, Go this one. As you can see, this is this person was fairly uh, conservative with what they actually wrote in their code. So they have the little bit at the beginning, loop digits, and then they specifically note the stuff you should change. So change this pin to the CS pin you're using. Uh, but they don't have comments on much, and so they just have here digits to show zero through nine. So that's talking about um, the first argument, so this one right here, count. Second argument, brightness, 0 to 127. Third argument, overdrive, 0 to disable, 1 to enable, 0. So they have a comment here to tell you about how to set this line up, but they're only telling you about that line. If I go to one of the earlier examples in that same code library, um, like, uh, did, whoops, not that one. Um, Well, let's go with like, uh, let's go servo easing. I believe this one's pretty in depth. Yeah, so you can see how much commenting there is in this one. So they have an entire block of commenting telling you about the software. Um, they have a bit about the plot. They have an entire chart telling you how to hook the specific things up on specific boards. Um, they have some little comments like forward declarations to enable, uh, so that they tell you that basically you should wait two seconds here. Um, <laughs> um, attach the servos to pins, and then they have this whole chunk of code here that is, is being run by that. Um, there was so, so you can kind of see what's going on here. It's not that they're commenting everything. And that's generally what you'll see, is that you don't comment everything in code. If you did, it would just get messy and you'd just be writing the same thing twice. Because in a lot of cases, uh, your code is pretty self-explanatory. 
like you don't need to tell someone what this means because if they're familiar with the map function this tells you what it is itself um, that's how a lot of this is is you only need to explain something when it's something that might be new or arbitrary or when there's something that you just want to have a note of like uh, like the, all this whole chunk of code will in deal with this thing or this whole chunk of code is where you put your code like things like this where you're basically saying um, this is a spot you should pay attention to because something here will have something is happening here um, let's see makes sense very helpful yeah and so uh, I can actually give an exam a pretty good example of what code might look like for beginners um, because I actually wrote a significant amount of Arduino code um, specifically for that. Um, so when I teach Arduino, I like to use these examples uh, that I, are modified from some of the examples for, that come with Arduino that I wrote. Uh, and so you'll see with things like this, I'll, I'll comment everything in the beginning of this. I have no idea why these are not spaced out all the same. They were when I started. Um, that is very weird. Just move them all to the right place. There we go. Um, but I'll comment like, so here I've commented every single line of this code. But if I move on to the number two, I think there might still be everything commented here because I'm still trying to be clear. Yeah, so I still have basically every line commented here. But as you see, as I move on to later and later scripts, you'll see less and less of the stuff gets commented. Um, again, I think I commented, yeah, so here you can see, I didn't bother commenting this because I literally am saying, it does the same thing except waits two seconds. Or it does the same thing, but this. Um, I have no reason to comment to write that twice. I have no reason to comment loop anymore because I expect they probably know what loop is at this point. Um, and you see, uh, well, I still comment that because it's, it's intro at some point we'll see less and less stuff getting commented. Um, so yeah, right here, you can see I'm only now commenting the new stuff. Only this stuff is new. And so only that needs to be commented. Um, and that will just progressively get more and more the case as these examples go on. I consider that to be good practice, that you shouldn't ever need to comment something you're doing more than once. Um, because there's, otherwise you're just, it's just like you're writing the code again. <laughs> um, and that might all get all the way down to, I don't know if I did plugged in or fixed. There's not a whole lot of commenting going on at this point. Yeah, so you can see the vast majority of the code now doesn't have any comments, and it's just the one special line that it gets a comment things like that uh, but in this case we have a lot of unique stuff going on so we probably want to comment everything um, but as an example I'm Durstenfeld shuffling here so I'm not ever going to say Durstenfeld I'm, I'm just going to say shuffles with Durstenfeld shuffle for every comment from here on out where that happens but we'll explain the Durstenfeld shuffle once uh, up here because why not <laughs> Um, so to Durstenfeld shuffle, we first have to, uh, pick a position at random. So, so I'm actually going to do little stars to show that this is underneath this. So pick position at random from... Range to be swapped with far right. Sorry, the reason I keep glancing over to the side all of a sudden is if I stop speaking or start speaking quickly for too long, the comment or like sorry, the caption area uh, of the stream changes a little bit. Um, 
and whenever that happens, I think a comment has been left because it's right next to the comments on my other screen. Um, and so if I, if I keep glancing over there for no reason, like suddenly, like I'm expecting something, that's what's going on. <laughs> um, it's just me out of the corner of my eye seeing something happen. Um, I probably should turn off the little thing there, but I, I do like to check it occasionally. Um, so here... We've picked a position. We now need to store what's in that position. Um, or in this case, I believe we're actually just storing all words, word count, line size, plus one. Okay, yeah, so store rightmost um, item temporarily. Place rightmost position with chosen position and uh, place random. stored item. Um, I guess this doesn't actually completely explain it because part of it here is important. Um, with um, hmm. I'm actually going to put one more item even though there's no code here. I'm going to put an item here and say uh, repeat for repeat uh, removing an item from the right every cycle until So that's the Durst and Feld shuffle. <laughs> um, so we've commented this whole function. That's basically done. Uh, this function is a little longer, so we're going to comment further out. That also will give us a nice separation between these. So checks if a word is currently possible comparing against all options. <laughs> the Durston fell. Yeah, technically I this is a form of Fisher Yates shuffle. That's the like official original creation. And Fisher Yates shuffle is literally the equivalent of pulling something out of a hat. So it's Take all the things, shuffle them around, pull something out of the hat, pull another thing out of the hat, pull another thing out of the hat, basically do that. Um, or more accurately, it's not really that you're shaking the hat around. It's like you put all the items in the hat and then you kind of randomly pick one out. And as long as you're randomly picking them out and putting them in order, it's fine. Um, the Durstenfeld shuffle is an implementation of the Fisher Yates shuffle that keeps in mind how computers work. And so technically, this is not this is a Durstenfeld shuffle because a Fisher Yates shuffle assumes there are two lists of that can change size. The Durstenfeld shuffle instead performs all of it within a single list, um, which is more accurate to how computers have to do things. So we will start. Um, I'm not actually sure if we need to comment this. Um, I think only this line is worth commenting. And so all we're doing here is we are saying um, for 
for every position. Actually, so we'll, we'll do this a little nicely. So we'll actually make this a multi-line sentence. So for every position, um, check if all options Character index is false. If any are true. Well, we'll say uh, if word is possible, return true. Um, so I think that's enough. Admittedly, this isn't great commenting, but I also think that this single line is simple enough to be understood, even though it is a fairly complex line. I mean, we're saying letter, uh, letter not possible is or equal to, which is a weird thing to say as a human, uh, or equal, <laughs> um, is or equal to not all options at I and at the test word character at I minus A. Um, but effectively all we're doing is we're just checking uh, so I guess we'll say check if the letter of the test word is impossible is still an option. And then if the if the entire word is possible, return true. Okay. I don't think we're gonna be getting the fusion today. We spent too long and too much time talking about actual passwords. <laughs> That's fine though. Um we didn't have much to do over there anyway. So this is one of the cases where I'm not sure if... Uh, <laughs> so there's a serial print here. There's a serial print here. And there's a long serial print here. And there's a serial print here. Um, having four serial print lines is not great. Um, preferably... Nothing is ever printed unless it's asked for. Um, now, I personally almost always set these via, so if I can open up a sketch that has this implemented, um, I believe I implemented into mazes. Yes. So you can see here, I have one of my, uh, oopsie, where'd it go? In this code, I have a define debug true. Um, and then whenever I have pieces of code that might rely on debug, or as an example, or OTA, define OTA true, I have if OTA followed by the code and if. What this means that you can actually have code not even show up if it, uh, so it's not that, that I'm just saying like, don't run the code. It's that the code will literally not exist on the Arduino. 
um, if that is not set up. And I kind of like that implementation. And so I think I'm going to go ahead and actually do that. So I'm going to make a debug. Um, and my, so basically up here somewhere, uh, we'll do it actually very high, um, just after the imports. Um, so we'll do here. So we'll make a new category and we'll call it Upload options, and we'll do a define um, we'll just call it uh, we'll call it debug. True. And so you'll notice just like here. Uh, we're using this pound symbol and it turns green. Tables, uh, serial, monitor. So it turns green here. What that means is that this is a preprocessor command. This tells this Arduino program, whoops, uh, what to do when it's getting ready to upload to the, the board, all of this code is not actually transferred to the board itself. The board never will see anything that's in a define or in one of these pound symbol areas. And so because it will never see any of it, we can basically use it to remove code that we don't necessarily want it to have. So if we do, as an example, pound, um, I want to make sure I'm doing this right. Yeah, so it's if and then end if. So if OTA, sorry, not OTA, we want, I think it was debug, yeah. If debug, so what that says is if debug is true, so you have to tab that in, end it. And so now this line about serial will only actually be uploaded to the board itself if debug is true. And we can do that anytime we have a, a serial line that we don't want, we may want to remove later on. Um, and what's nice about doing it this way is that we get both the benefit of having this these really nice serial prints available to us, while also allowing us to, with a single change, turn them all off later on. And even though it makes our code here a little messier, it means that the board will never have to do, it's not uh, ever affecting our board, our final result. Um, so I kind of like this as a, if debug, tab that in. And yes, I know that is a giant line. Um, so if you're curious, this gigantic line basically is able to put together a lot of information into a single line um, by adding up a lot of data. <laughs> uh, it's just more convenient to have it a single line, especially if I'm doing this. And finally, there's one more here. <laughs> so if debug, tab. And we need to do that in a few. So uh, meanwhile, so as an example, this print options thing doesn't even need to exist if we're not printing options. So I'm just going to do the entire the entire thing will be within an, an if. So if debug. And I do think you're supposed to tab in the stuff. I'm not sure if it actually matters. Uh, I don't think it does. I think preprocessor commands don't care about uh, indentation, but I also think it makes the, everything look nicer to have everything indented correctly. So I'm going to do it anyway. <laughs> and there's 
no prints here. There, this is another print function. Um, so one thing, this is a print function, that's a print function. I'm actually gonna just move them to be together. So I'm gonna take all of this and cut it out. Leave these two up here. And I'm gonna come down here and add it with the other print function. And get rid of this line. Tab all of this in. I'm sure there's an easier way to do this, but okay. And finally, I can do. So we have our debugging functions here. Um, obviously, we don't need to. Uh, Something, I guess I put the void there, but I don't actually care if it's there. Um, and then for this bit, again, this is print stuff. Um, so we could remove all of it, but at the moment, um, all of this code will probably change. And so I'm just going to put an, an if here. So if debug that that and, if. and let's double check that this still compiles it should although mm, yeah okay so uh, now interestingly I believe if I make this false this should not compile anymore because we're calling functions that are not yep there it goes so because I've made these functions here conditional on whether or not debug is true, if this debug is false and this is still here or, and print options is still here, it fails because as far as the program is concerned, that doesn't exist now. It's literally like I deleted the code. So we have to keep that true at the moment. Um, <laughs> But it's very convenient down the line to have something like this here because it means we can turn that on and off at will once we get to that point. Um, so I guess we can get along to remove letters. Um, which So this is one of the cases of there are these two lines that are extraordinarily long. I don't consider them to be part of the commenting schema. They're just too big. And so I'm actually going to make the comments come out to about here. About there, maybe. Uh, in fact, I kind of like the idea that they're in line with that. Yeah, about here. Um, because there's no way I'm going to have my comments way out here. That's just too far off screen. Um, I have a very wide screen, and I don't like my comments going off of them, <laughs> if possible. So remove letters. Uh, so that's what it says on the tin. Uh, removes. Well, maybe we shouldn't say that. Um, removes letters as options from random positions until only. Well, actually, only the first is possible. There we go. That's the more accurate thing that it's doing. Uh, I'm not going to explain this. That's need explaining. Um, I'm going to just mention this variable offhandedly. Um, this will be set to true if uh, something prevents a word from being made impossible. Um, let's see. I don't think there's any reason to explain that. Um, if 
the word is already impossible to nothing. Actually, I guess we can say instead only remove a letter the word is possible create an array for removal and did this So I'll say create an array for tracking of evil and did it. Shuffling the array. Shuffle, that spelled that right. D U R S T E N. Yeah, okay. And this is all Durston Feld shuffle here. Um, so I think I might just to show that that's the case, um, I'm just going to do little stars at each one. This is a bit of a weird one, so I should explain this definitely. This is where the weird code starts, um, especially those giant lines. But um, so, how do I best explain this? So this really, these two really long lines, this if and then these statements, um, I think I am going to comment them out here. It's really far, but I think it kind of needs to be in line. So if um, the selected word conflicts with the correct word or if removing the letter would remove too many options in that Okay, I think this is too long. <laughs> I'm going to do this as an inline comment. Or sorry, not as an inline. This is an inline comment. Uh, I want it to be a non-inline comment. Um, so we'll do it here. Because it's very long as is. But I am going to actually separate this out so it's kind of like its own little bubble here. I find that sometimes can help. Um, so that's what that gigantic line is. Um, move the letter 
options. In order, so success for all options are attempted. I'm going to put in parentheses that's 10, and all options are attempted is 5. I'm going to remove this break I added. Um, down this one, I don't think they're actually necessary. Here, uh, if so, a set full loop will exit with ten. Fail will exit with five. And Tell if that's in line or not. I think that is. What, what, what position am I at? Oh, it doesn't tell me. Uh, okay, fine, I'll just do it this way. Okay, we have commented that one. Um, hopefully that helps anyone who's trying to figure out what in the world is going on with this uh, to understand. Um, yeah, hopefully. <laughs> it still is a nightmare of a uh, function though. And this one isn't exactly all that much better. Um, <laughs> I prefer to have this can just come out somewhere where it's not going to intersect. Reduce the all options desired number and shuffle them. And we already can kind of just do a Shuffle the chosen options using system spelled shuffle. That's all that taken care of. <laughs> we'll do the little slash slash star though. happy with this implementation of that that works very cleanly um, so for every letter position let's just say repeat 
for every letter position. This has to do with that. And then for every remaining position. Exactly, was this uh, while non options? Mm. Like that. Oh, right. This is a this is an inline. Um, I'm actually going to indent this bit of code here. So here, I'm going to go in ex uh, two extra ones <coughs> and start this. So create a tracker for position within all options array. Move the tracker to the first possible option. Um, select a random number from zero to the of possible options Move forward that number of times. Ensuring the tracker lands on a valid position for every count. Um, this is a bit of a weird piece of code, but basically what I'm doing is I'm going across an array, and so I'm saying like, I wanna move five positions along, but some of those positions can be empty, and so what this does is it actually skips empty positions. So I can have an array that's 26 long, but only have five possible letters in it, and I can say go to the fourth letter and it, it'll skip all of those empty spots and actually go to the fourth real letter, not the fourth position, which may be empty. Um, let's see, final options, A plus cups. Oh yeah, okay. Um, this is basically this piece of code here. Add the selected letter to the final set. Like that. And I think 
Oh, okay. I think this is actually one too far that way. Move. The option for future. Oops. that and remove it from future oops and remove from future oops I'll just do the little this little thing again because I kind of like that whenever we're continuing a function do that and it looks like we we just need to move everything under one. Make it look nice. A little bit of that. I think that looks pretty good. It looks like we're about eight o'clock, so I think we have about finished up here. I think this is looking pretty good as far as commenting. Uh, it's at least somewhat understandable what in the world is going on now, um, which is the point of comments. Yeah, time really does get fast. I mean, we did spend like 30 some 40 minutes just talking about passwords for a while. So I think that's where part of the time went. But it's nice to sit back, relax, code on something in inconsequential right now. <laughs> but yeah, I think we made a lot of progress. <laughs> um, I've got, I'll probably go ahead and finish up commenting this a little later. Um, just add in the give some comments on the debug. Um, probably not much. You don't really need much when you're printing because uh, it kind of just says it says what it does on the pin. Um, but I'll probably add just a line on each to say what it does. Add a few comments to say why things are here the way they are. And uh, yeah, I think that's pretty good. So. Thanks everyone for joining us tonight. Uh, I think we made a good bit of progress on this code. We also had a lot of fun messing around with uh, things like the password database and just talking about that. So I enjoy it. Uh, if you have any questions or uh, issues, feel free to contact ask us after we're done um, as they will still be around. But hope everyone had a good night. I know I had fun. And, uh, yeah, we'll see. Uh, well, I'll be on probably next. Well, I, I'm actually not sure if we're going to be doing next Tuesday. I think we are. We're nearing the end of the semester here. So I think streams will maybe start to be slowing down soon. Um, but, yeah, we'll probably see you sometime again soon. Uh, and there should be more streams later this week from the VR studio. So uh, have a good night, everyone. And I'll see you later. <laughs>